there is going to be a bit of more a digression from the topic of our workshop, maybe with the coming talk or presentation, but just uh, just some remarks before I start. Um, I'm at the moment in the summer term a fellow in Leipzig at the Leipzig Lab, so my coming into this workshop was a bit of a, a late, late process, and uh, uh, as you can see with the title of the talk, it's not directly directly addressing uh, um, maybe the, the Hegelian uh, canonical text we talked about in the last two days. And also my, my background is a bit different, so I'm, I'm teaching in the day-to-day -day practice at the University of the Arts in Berlin, so I mainly deal with fine arts students and becoming art teachers, teaching their philosophy to people who don't really study philosophy, which is an interesting um, um, experience. Uh, and in my, my PhD project, I was dealing with uh, the concept of the present and the artwork in Adorno, Deleuze and Badiou. And also already with this three authors, you can see that my relation to he Hegel might be a bit distorted, maybe uh, one true Hegelians would say. But um, even more maybe with the, with the material I want to present today, but um, which is mainly a, a text by, by the French philosopher Maurice Blanchot and an uh, addressing of nuclear threat and, uh, and also climate catastrophe. And so this is more of, I would say, um, a presentation relating to contemporary problems or catastrophic scenarios. But you will see, hopefully, when I lay out the, the Blanchot text, that there is an Hegelian operation running through this argument of Blanchot and uh, a, a notion of the idea of humanity. Which then maybe connects again to the topic of our workshop, as you can understand the idea of humanity as a form of realization of, of reason or the good. So I, I'm trying to dwell a bit on this, um, yeah, this place of the idea of humanity, as to say, in, in catastrophic scenarios, as the nuclear threat was conceived in the middle of the 20th century, and maybe nowadays again, to certain uh, events, and also try to relate this to, to the question of climate, climate change. So uh, and the main reference of my talk is going to be Maurice Blanchot in the, in, the, in the main part, but also a German essayist and philosopher Günther Anders. So, and the presentation is meant to be more as an yeah, invitation to a discussion of this yeah, contemporary situations, namely nuclear threat and climate catastrophe, and how it relates to the idea of humanity. So, and I will um, uh, start now. Asking about the good means asking about the end. Orienting action to the question of the good means orienting it to an end. Or relating an action to the question of the good means placing it in the perspective of the end. However, the end as a figure of fulfillment, which one might associate with the question of the good and the discussions about means to an end, seems no longer to be prevailing in the present. Today, when public imaginary refers or relates to an end, the end appears mostly or predominantly as the end in the form of self-destruction or self-annihilation. And where in the contemporary situation action is presented or experienced as urgent, necessary or required, it is no longer a potential articulation or realization of the good, but rather a means of preventing the end, namely an end of the world. Today what is conceived to be prevented is a full-scale extinction that destroys the possibilities of human life and that is therefore imagined uh, very often as an end of the possibility of action itself. So you, when you think about this famous quote by Greta Thunberg, Our house is on fire, uh, which she gave in this uh, Davos speech in 2019 and which got famous, I think it uh, expresses something like this, that the ecological changes we are living through are imagined as of such tremendous scale that human life 
in itself is threatened. Thus, in the present, action is urgent, action is required, because an end must be prevented. An end that is then no longer necessary, rendered in the perspective or framework of the good. This relation to the end in a perspective or of prevention is rather connected with the affect of fear, with mechanisms of defense or repression, than with the expectation of a coming fulfillment or of a set of actions as realization of the good. So if today climate change is understood as an event or process that threatens humanity as such, then it does not introduce a radical novelty. Already the imaginary of the nuclear threat in the middle of the 20th century confronted human life with its potential annihilation. The German philosopher and essayist Günther Anders, for example, speaks of a potentiated mortality as the key novelty brought by the atom bomb. Not only the individual members of the species are mortal, but now the species itself has become mortal. Our time is conceived by Günther Anders as the time of the deadline, which is in German Frist, so deadline is Frist, an end time marked by the threat of the end of time itself. This end time is therefore not an epoch like others, but the ultimate last epoch that does not allow any other epoch to emerge. Being at end times, at the end of days, means living in a time in which something has not yet occurred and yet is already in effect, a time that is strangely awesome oscillates between the future and the present of the apocalypse, in which one always already finds oneself in the apocalypse as an event that one tries to prevent by announcing it. According to Günther Anders, the deadline introduced by the atomic threat, uh, with, with the deadline introduced by the atomic threat, our relation to time radically changes. Time is no longer a medium for events, nor is it a conditional form in the Kantian sense. Time has become something conditioned. Since the end time is not an epoch, not a period of history followed by another, our time, claims Anders, becomes indistinguishable from time as such, time in general. So in the end times, or at the end of days, that which takes place in time, and time as form, coincide. If that which takes place in time, the conditioned, and time as a conditional form coincide, then what collapses is historical temporality, time as history. So this potentiated mortality also means that history as a horizon of events and meaning becomes mortal beyond the lifetime of the, of the individual. What appeared as the collective singular of history and which we were used to conceptualize as the event of a temporalization of time paradoxically becomes a final part of itself. So on the level of temporality, and a threatening end, a catastrophe scenario, thus has a unifying effect. According to Anders, with respect to the conditioned character of time, change is no longer imaginable. So this is his thesis, because we live in the end time, uh, this time is itself without beginning or end, in the sense of a period of time that always allows for another beginning or end to come. But even if regarding the conditioned character of time uh, and change is not possible anymore, Anders still passionately calls for change. He states that the pre preservation of the world, a continuation of the world in face of the atomic bomb, can only succeed, succeed by radical change. Here the transformative force ultimately remains ambivalent because to preserve the whole the whole of the world, you must change it. And at the same time, you can never really change the structure of the whole. But what could one, uh, one could ask then is the power and scope of such a change. 
What is a change that preserves a whole precisely by transforming it? What is a change that is never able to alter the whole in its structure? To put it differently, what is the relation between change, preservation, and the whole in the time that is conceived as the deadline, as the end of time? In response to Karl Jaspers, and I will uh, change now to uh, Maurice Blanchot, in response to Karl Jaspers' radio lecture and book, The Atom Bomb and the Future of Man, which was released in 1957, Maurice Blanchot published a short essay that is still challenge, challenging considering contemporary discourses of the end or current apocalyptic modes of speech. Blanchot's text begins with a critique of Jaspers. For Jaspers, the atom bomb brings the potential self-annihilation of humanity. This, Jaspers argues, must change the structure of political consciousness. The atomic threat, he argues, requires a fundamental transformation of human existence. This transformation must be accomplished at the individual level, by each individual. Blanchot notes, the language, the political formulations, the thinking, have remained the same in Jaspers, despite his plea for transformation. This is because Jaspers uses the threat of the atom bomb Adam Baum only as leverage or alibi to enforce already existing political positions and traditional existing values. And I think this is quite an important move one can also see in other discourses, not only in, in, in the situation of the Adam Bomb, but also in other catastrophic scenarios that people, while referring to this catastrophe in, 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 in doing so, really want to um, um, uh, enforce already existing political um, um, assumptions or existential values. Uh, so, in, in doing so, Jaspers ultimately combines the threat of the end of to humanity with the threat of the spread of communism. So, this is the real opponent of Jaspers in this 1957 book. For him, the total annihilation by the atom bomb and the total domination in form of communism are ultimately two co-equal threats. In contrast, in the essay by Blanchot, which I'm going to um, uh, um, present now, uh, and the title is The Apocalypse is Disappointing, in this essay, which appeared in 1964, Blanchot approaches the atom bomb as a problematic event that opens up the question of the totality of humanity in a new way. Blanchot sees the atom bomb as an enigmatic, ambiguous event. It challenges humanity in its totality, but at the same time, and this is Blanchot's, we could say, bold hypothesis, through the problematic event, the idea of this totality becomes conceivable as such for the first time. And there's a quote by Monchot. What does the problematic event teach us? So, the problematic event of the other world. This. That insofar as it puts into question the human species in, in its totality, it is also because of this event that the idea of totality arises visibly and for the first time on our horizon." End of quote. Disappointing, however, the apocalypse of the atom bomb is said to be because it merely indicates an unmastered possibility, a power at disposal of the rulers in which those ruled by them do not participate. According to Blanchot, it refers to a power that man does not appropriate and which he therefore characterizes as a negative power. So, the idea of the totality, as it appears in the negative shape of the potential extinction of humanity by the atom bomb, must therefore be disappointing, according to Blanchot, because the totality remains abstract. Blanchot subsequently transforms this abstract idea of the whole into a provoking argument 
for communism which has yet to be invented. He claims, humanity which can be completely destroyed or annihilated and whose extinction one fears does not yet exist as a whole. It is divided into the rulers and the ruled. He then develops the remarkable thought that humanity becomes affirmable only by the event of the atom bomb and in the form of the potential disappearance of humanity. So, and this is the, the provoking, I think, thesis that shows that the realization of reason in Blanchot and the total annihilation form a kind of a strange or uncanny alliance. And I give you uh, another quote from this text that maybe uh, uh, not all of you might know. Uh, so the quote, for the moment we are just as incapable of mastering it as we are of wanting it, and for an obvious reason. We are not in control of ourselves because this humanity, humanity capable of being totally destroyed does not yet exist as a whole. On the one hand, there is a power that cannot be, and on the other, an existence, the human community, that can be wiped out but not affirmed, or that could be affirmed, in some sense, only after its disappearance and by the void, impossible to grasp, of this disappearance. Consequently, it is something that cannot even be destroyed because it does not exist yet. End of quote. This text is challenging because in it the end or the apocalypse is no longer simply something one hopes for or something one is afraid of. Blanchot's text confronts us with a paradoxical implication of a communism as the totality of a real, realized humanity. Only in humanity's free decision to appropriate the possibility of its own total annihilation Thus, this humanity generate itself as an autonomous collective subject. In other words, the apocalypse is disappointing if it remains without subject. And here the text, as you all maybe might sense, is structured by the Hegelian fundamental operation of the negative power of understanding, Verstand, which it, uh, is distinguished from reason as phenomenon. And I give you another quote, which is in kind of somehow, uh, I would say, a, a variation or alternation of the phenomenology of spirit. Quote, the power of understanding is an absolute power of negation. Understanding knows only through the force of separation, that is, of destruction. Analyze it, analyze, analyzes vision and at the same time knows only the destructible and is certain only of what could be destroyed. Through understanding, we know very precisely what must be done in order for the final annihilation to occur. But we do not know which resources to, solid, to, to solicit to prevent it from occurring. What understanding gives us is the knowledge of catastrophe, and what it predicts, foresees, and grasps by means of decisive anticipation is the possible of possibility of the end. Thus man is held to the whole, first of all by the force of understanding, and understanding is held to the whole by negation. Whence the insecurity of all knowledge, of all knowledge that bears on the whole. End of quote. So, in the apocalypse is disappointing, Blanchot assumes that with the atom bomb, a negative relation to the totality is established. Humans acquire a destructive power about the whole, which as power, however, only indicates an unmastered possibility, a probability, a power therefore which is not our power, because the subject of this power does not yet exist as a whole. If the subject of this power would exist instead of merely the object of this power, this power would no longer be feared, Blanchot claims. Consequently, in a Hegelian fashion, 
For him, it is a matter of elevating the fact of the annihilation of humanity to the concept, to elevate the negation to negativity. That is transcending the register of understanding towards reason in order to produce the whole in the first place. Thereby, in Blanchot's text, totality is in a peculiar way that which is already at work and at the same time that whose idea one must first awake to. But so Vernunft erwachen is a phrase that he uses in the text. So he says, yeah, reason is already at work uh, on the one hand, and on the other hand there is some quotation where you find that uh, uh, reason itself must awake. Um, so on the one hand, reason realizes itself in the movement of the negative force of contradiction through anti antagonism, struggle, and violence, and thereby in its extreme form, reason, which is already at work, exposes itself to the danger of annihilation. Yeah, as you, I mean, this is the argument. The atom bomb, in a strange way, is the kind of the means also to the dialectic of reason. Yeah, so that you have this strange figure that while realizing itself, reason exposes itself to the uh, uh, annihilation which brought by the atom bomb. So there the totality is already at work, but on the other hand, reason which must first awake, as Blanchot puts it in his text, still waits for itself. And while waiting for itself, waiting for its own realization, it de degradates itself in face of understanding. So this is another figure that he says, uh, reason kind of still waiting for itself to realize, kind of pushes its own task on, uh, on the shoulders of understanding. And I give you the, the quote for this, this is the last quote then um, I have. <clears throat> reason in anticipation of itself and immobilized by this anticipation seems only to want to win time and in order to win time, passes off to the understanding the task that it is not yet able to master. In such a way that the caption that would best illustrate the blackboard of our time might be this one, the anticipation of reason humbling itself before understanding. End of quote. And this is the, the important notion yeah, here, the, the anticipation, anticipation of reason humbling itself before understanding. Um, and I'm trying uh, in the last bits now to, to connect this um, um, to, the, to the idea of the deadline I introduced in the first part with, with Anders and to then make a shift to, to climate uh, catastrophe. By directing our attention to the deadline, to the limited time there might be left to finally act, understanding, in measuring and limiting the time that it has left, plays the peculiar role of increasing the urgency of the task, and at the same time disenchanting, softening it. Understanding, so Verstand, creates the situation of the deadline, and at the same time, at the same moment, postpones it. Um, today, one could say the means of understanding for calculation uh, um, all time that has been left for measuring our deadline are becoming more and more refined. So in a strange way, today, in, in ecological transformation, understanding measures and determines its own prospective coming to an end. Uh, what was once the biblical warning sign in the apocalypse now in, in our contemporary situation of ecological crisis appears in the form of data processing and calculations as a scientifically founded prediction which identifies irreversible tipping points. It's a kind of a universal extinction as a technological scientific modeling. So this is the strange thing, right? We have all the time this uh, data or this reports that kind of said you have seven years left, you have eight years left for doing this and this, then it will be the point of no return where all things 
start to collapse, right? And I wonder how this is connected to, to what Longshaw says when he speaks about um, um, understanding humbling uh, itself, uh, 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 reason humbling itself before understanding. Um, so, to put it differently, is it the last said triumph of Verstand, understanding, which cannot stop to identify, dissect, and calculate uh, in this kind of measuring the deadline? Or is it, in, on the contrary, contrary a reclaiming of historical time uh, in the detemporalized time of the deadline? An attempt to regenerate a new historical time in the in the timelessness of the deadline. So the question here is, are the status of these reports or this pleas for action in, in figures like Greta Thunberg and others, are those elements or signs of an awakening of reason, yeah? testimonies to the humble efforts uh, uh, um, um, to relate scientific analysis uh, uh, to our action? Or are these forms still articulations of the humbling or degradation of the reason? So is the focus today on calculating and modeling the contemporary figure of degradation or a step towards the awakening of reason? Um, I'm trying to skip some parts here because I'm running out of time on the deadline. Um, So, um, maybe a, a, a thing about the difference of those temporalities of these two catastrophic events, the nuclear threat and the climate uh, uh, catastrophe, that today sometimes are thought to be an end of humanity, maybe in a questionable sense. Uh, while one unfolds in a few seconds or minutes, the other appears as a series of processes and events that extend over long periods of time, while the one, the atom bomb, can be linked to an initiating action that is associated with an identifiable subject, a consciousness, a decision. The other, uh, ecological transformation, is rather a disparate, uh, disparate sequence of more or less subjectless actions that only becomes recognizable as a unified structure of action with the help of scientific analysis, data collections, and corresponding conclusions. So in the case of ecological transformation, we are confronted with a cascade of effects resulting from a multitude of actions or habitual patterns. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to end with a, with a question here. I'm going to skip some parts. My question would be in this framework of understanding and reason, uh, using this long show notion of the awakening of reason, uh, when relating to those, to those two events, how can one awake to the idea of the whole, to the idea of totality, when this whole, as a catastrophe, seems to anticipate itself as a quasi-natural accumulation of effects? and at the same time to delay itself by its processuality and thus just e evade the appropriation in the form of what Blanchot called a decision or a resolution. So how can one produce, create, endow the totality of the whole of humanity in the face of a catastrophic series of events that are subjected to an automatism, to the logic of the effect, rather than that of the subjective uh, resolution or uh, decision. Um, um, yeah, uh, Alenka Tsupancic in an article about Longchamp argues that this his perspective of a whole presupposes presupposes an external standpoint from which this whole appears as a whole. The external point of view is temporalized in Blanchot through the threat of apocalypse. However, she argues, this is no longer our apocalypse. Our apocalypse, 
that of climate catastrophe or the Anthropocene, therefore no longer has to do with a perspective that is oriented towards the loss of coal in a single incomprehensible event. Compared to that threat of an action represented in the image of a single traumatic pressing of a button which triggers a nuclear catastrophe, according to Tsupanchich, the situation of climate catastrophe is different. It is a different temporality of the catastrophe. Quote, the wrong button has already been pressed. The apocalypse has already begun and is about to become an active part of our lives and our world as it is. End of quote. We are then already in the very midst of the apocalypse. It is no longer a future event that we can prevent or anticipate as a realization of reason. It is already here, already unfolding. So, um, and this I, I phrase now as an end. If this is so, that this uh, temporality changes in this scenario, this must not only influence the role of a pos possible prophylactic apocalyptic like Günther Anders was, who was seeing his role primarily in, in wanting to be falsified in his announcement of the apocalypse, uh, it must also influence the resolution or the decision that Maurice Planchot thinks as the construction of a collective subject in the potential annihilation, as the moment in which humanity awakens to the idea of its totality and thus to reason. So the question is, does this temporal logic of the deadline still function with its emphatic now as soon as the apocalypse is one that is already happening, can reason still awake in the appropriation of the negative power? Can one still produce the whole by a resolution or decision if it has Thank you.